The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Jesus prayed for his disciples, and then he said, I ask not only on behalf of these, but also on behalf of those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, as you, Father, are in me, and I am in you. May they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given them, so that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may become completely one, so that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them, even as you have loved me. Father, I desire that those also whom you have given me may be with me where I am to see my glory, which you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. Righteous Father, the world does not know you, but I know you, and these know that you have sent me. I made your name known to them, and I will make it known, so that the love with which you have loved me may be in them, and I in them. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise to you. Please be seated. We begin with sharing with you a reading taken from a homily of St. Gregory of Nyssa, who lived in the 5th century. When love has cast out fear from our souls completely, and all fear in us has been transformed into love, then the unity, which is the gift of our Savior, will be fully realized among us, because we will all be united with each other through our union with the one supreme good. Following his ascension, after conferring all power on his disciples by his blessing, Our Lord obtained many other gifts for them by his prayer to the Father. Among these was the greatest gift of all, which was that they were no longer to be divided in their judgment about what was right and good, because they were all to be united in the one supreme good. As the apostle says, they were to be bound together with the bonds of peace and the unity that comes from the Holy Spirit. They were to be made one body and one spirit by the one hope to which they were all called. We shall do well, however, to quote the sacred words of the gospel itself. I pray, the Lord says, that they all may be one, that as you, Father, are in me and I am in you, so they also may be one in us. Now the bond that creates this unity is glory. That the Holy Spirit is called glory, no one can deny if one reflects upon our Lord's words, the glory you gave to me, I have given to them. In fact, he gave his glory to his disciples when he said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. Though he had always possessed it, even before the world existed, our Lord received this glory when he put on human nature. Then, when his human nature had been glorified by the Spirit, the glory of the Spirit was passed on to all his brothers and sisters, beginning with his disciples. This is why he said, The glory you gave to me, I have given to them, so that they may be one as we are one, with me in them and you in me. I want them to be perfectly one. Whoever then grows from infancy to adulthood and attains to spiritual maturity, possesses the mastery of human compulsions, and an inner purity that makes it possible 
to receive the glory of the Spirit. I thought that because that excerpt talked specifically about the gospel that we just heard, that it would be good for us to hear something by one of the fathers of the church that was written about 1,600 years ago, because it's still the truth. And that we, although many times we don't remember it or maybe don't ever think about it, have received the glory that Christ already has. Now, just this past Thursday, we celebrated the Feast of the Ascension of our Lord into Heaven, the 40th day of Easter. And that was all about Christ's entering into glory of the Father, going back to where he was before, and reminding us of where our ultimate goal is in union with him in the heavenly places that St. Paul talks about so often. But in the meantime, Christ has prayed in the gospel today for us also to be one. And he promises the Spirit as he ascends into heaven that the Holy Spirit will come upon us and will make that possible. And as Gregory says, that glory that Jesus talks about is the Holy Spirit, is the life of God, the very life of God poured out upon us that's given to us in our baptism and that the Lord continues to renew and refresh in us. It's good to remember that next Sunday, the ninth day or the tenth day, depending on how one reckons, from Ascension Thursday, will be the 50th day of Easter, Pentecost, where it gets its name from the Greek word for 50. And that will be the day when we remember the coming of the Holy Spirit, not just as a commemoration saying, okay, that's nice, now we know where the Holy Spirit came from. But one of the refrains that day that we will hear is, Lord, send forth your spirit and renew the face of the earth. And rather than it being idle words that we will be saying, or just something because it's written down for us, that hopefully during this week leading up to it, that we will reflect a little bit more on what it means to share in this glory, what it means to have the Holy Spirit, and what it will mean for us to say, Re, you know, pour out your spirit and renew the face of the earth. Renew me. Renew us. You know, not so many days ago, the big and tragic event that took place in Texas reminded us that that unity for which Christ prays that unity which he continues to make intercession to the Father on our behalf, that that unity is once again demonstrated as not being much of a reality because of the various reactions to this tragic and heinous crime that took place. All we have to do is just recollect, go on the internet, what have you, of the reactions of various politicians on one side of the issue or the other, all of whom decry what happened, but all of whom propose solutions that sometimes are quite disparate. And then you go through everything that has happened in our country in just the last couple of months of all of the different shootings that there have been, whether in Chicago or or in Buffalo, or elsewhere in Texas, or in almost anywhere else that there have been these acts of violence. And every time, everybody weighs in. Most of the time, 
everybody decries what happened, and that's only right and just that we would do that, because it is such a horrible crime. No matter if it's one person or 21 people, or the, like all of those who died in Las Vegas a few years ago, over 50 killed by a, a single gun. And there are all kinds of solutions that are proposed. And all of those things have their own merits. But I think that what St. Gregory is getting at and what Jesus is praying for is that just like we saw witness in the first reading today of conversion of heart based on initially a situation of, of, of terror for the jailer. We are faced with this situation of being called not to facile and easily spoken of solutions, but to something that is more basic, and that is conversion of hearts. And that's easy for me to say, but I know that for me, and I would suspect for you as well, a conversion of heart is a demanding thing. To ask the power of the Holy Spirit to transform my way of thinking and speaking and acting, to allow that glory that has already been shared with me, with you, with all of us who have been baptized into Christ's death and resurrection, who have received that gift of the presence and the power and the magnificence and the glory of God in the person of the Holy Spirit, that that is a, can be a frightening as well as a demanding thing. Because then it says, you, Michael, you have to let go. You have to try to think differently by the grace and the power that I give you. That you have to see that it's within you that the solutions, as tainted as even they will be, have to begin. There needs to be a true conversion of heart, particularly from those who profess our Christian faith, to the dignity and the value of the gift of life that God has given us. There can be all kinds of solutions proposed, and are always being so, and still will be. And they all may contribute something to making life less dangerous or what have you, or a little less insecure. But what usually happens is that we default to that condition we call original sin. The world that we live in, even though redeemed by our Lord Jesus Christ's death and resurrection, and all we, though we share by our baptism in that redemption, that we still are assailed as the world also by original sin. That desire of the human beings to say, God, if you exist, we know better than you how we should run this world. We know better than you what the solution is. We know better than you what's right and what's wrong. We thank you for your contribution, but we need to do this on our own. So butt out. We may not be that dramatic, but there are those who are. And there are those who just think that whatever God said has nothing to do with what goes on in this world. May have something to do with what we do here on a Sunday morning or whenever but it has nothing to do with daily life. Got to keep those things separate. You know? But the truth of the matter is, 
There's never going to be anything that happens, no laws passed, no nothing, until there's a true conversion of heart. And by that I mean, and you may disagree even vociferously with what I'm about to say, but I need to say this because I firmly believe it. If we believe that every life matters, then what we need to do is to be respectful of life in every stage, in every form, from conception to death. What kind of a message does it give to some people if we can exterminate life in the womb to guarantee the right of the mother or the father or both or whatever the justification may be? And I realize there are there are incidences and ramifications, but just the very idea that this can be just sort of part and parcel of the picture of our life in this country through, and throughout the Western world and many other places. If life is that cheap, that since the legalization of abortion in this country, that 60 to 70 million lives have been snuffed out. What does that say to other people about acts of violence? That that doesn't matter. Life is cheap. You can do away with it here legally, or you can take your chance in trying to deal with it in another way. Either case, a human being has died, whether you believe it's a human being in the womb of its mother or not, Tell me what it really is. And if that message is so clear and so vocal and so angrily put to us, as it's been in the last month or two, since the leak in Washington from the Supreme Court, regardless of the motive for the leak, and regardless of where you may stand on the issue, we have to understand that if that most innocent form of life can be attacked and killed with impunity, why should any other life be any more valuable? Sure, life outside, life that's grown up should be protected. I'm not saying that it shouldn't be. But if we don't protect that innocence of life, what about when other innocents like those children in Uvalde die because of a crazed person? Now, none of this means that it, it's anything is ever going to be easy. None of these things mean that there are simple solutions. And there are going to be always differences of opinion. But I believe very firmly and I share with you that we, as believing, professing Christians of whatever denomination, have to remember again what we already have been given and what we are called to do in this world. Because one of our responsibilities based on our baptism and we in the Episcopal Church, in particular, in the promises of baptism after all of the creedal statements, we always say that we pledge ourselves to respect and, the, and, respect and uphold the dignity of every human life. And that means that our attitudes and our ideas and our way of being has to continuous, have to be continuously renewed by the power of the Holy Spirit so that the kind of witness we give is not the witness that winks at some things and then allows other things to happen, but by the grace of the Holy Spirit and the wisdom of the Holy Spirit that we can judge a little better what 
upholds the dignity and what doesn't. And try to support those things and pray that our own attitudes can be shaped so that we do. If all the Christians in the United States really began to live our faith more deeply, really understanding what we are called to be and what we've been given and what it means to share already in the glory of God. Because as I said on Ascension Thursday, quoting St. Irenaeus from the second century, the glory of God is the human person fully alive. And being fully alive is being filled with the love of God. And where more are we filled with the love of God than right here? What we do here this morning. And what the Lord invites us to every day by praying every day. Not by trying to become something we're not, but by submitting ourselves every day to the reality that God is God. That the Lord has called us and that we, in order to live out this life, need to pray, need to relate to this Lord who has called us and who loves us and who continues to make intercession for us. So that we can become like Paul and Silas in the first reading today, reassuring the jailer after the miracle happens that nobody goes away. But in such a convincing way of praying when they were singing, not only did the prisoners not run away, but the jailer didn't have to do himself in as he was preparing to do as a noble Roman who would have failed in his duty. And not only does he not kill himself, but he becomes a disciple. Thanks to the witness of Paul and Barnabas, not just what they taught, but by the very witness of their lives. And don't forget what Jesus says in the reading today from the Revelation to John. Jesus says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, like on the Paschal candle, that thing, that A and that thing that looks like a U upside down, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, that that's the one to whom we submit ourselves because he is the beginning, he is the end, and he's everything in between. And that light on the Paschal candle, even when that is not lit, is still the light that's with us, the light that's meant to burn brightly in this world, the light that's been shared with you and me, and the light that we bear. In a little while, Jesus will give himself again to us, his body and blood, in Holy Communion. And when he does, he comes to us as we are, and he asks us, to open ourselves as we are to the grace that he gives us today, to that powerful presence that reminds us that in truth, we are already one in him, and he also is one with us. And if we are one with him, then we're also one with the Father and the Holy Spirit. And that means that the glory that he has given to us is not something that we should ever take for granted or trifle with or besmirch in any way, but that we should allow to continue to form and shape and guide us so that we can really be the witnesses that we have been created and called to be.